Bula and uh, welcome to The Lens at 177, the Fiji Times online news portal. On this show, we are so pleased and happy to have with us someone who does not need a lot of introduction, uh, one of the more colourful characters in Parliament, um, our Minister for Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation, Linda Tambuya Bula. Madam, thank you for joining us on the show. Bula Vinaka Felix and uh, Bula Vinaka Fiji. Uh, colourful is a very interesting word. As you see, I'm uh, very colourful today, uh, really. Um, celebrating uh, Indi India Independence Day, which was yesterday officially, right. yes. but you know, we'll be celebrating all week. So um, in any event, I do enjoy wearing a sari. It's very comfortable. And also we get, you know, the opportunity to be fashionable yes. <laughs> at it. But, uh, you know, thank you for this opportunity, Felix, to speak to our people. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to get straight into it. Uh, you know, six months into taking over one of the most challenging ministries. Uh, not an easy task, uh, you know, given the issues we face with poverty and all sorts of uh, other related issues. So wh what's it been like six months into the job? It has been uh, challenging is the word, yes. but also uh, very interesting for us. Uh, you know, uh, community work is not new to me. Right. Uh, I've, it's my passion. Yes. Uh, and so coming into the ministry for me, it was the ministry I chose, okay. actually. Right. Um, I was given a few choices. Yes. I wanted to be in this ministry. I believe uh, it is the human face of government and it is where our most vulnerable need help. And right. I believe with what my experience has taught me working with the community, I'm able to bring that into the ministry. Right. I am a lawyer by profession yes. and also uh, you know, I have uh, six children, so working with children has been pretty much my adult life. Yes. Um, I actually did, uh, you know, my life backwards. Some people may call it backwards, Felix. You know, right. I. I chose um, family first, right. so I, I um, was only a year and a half into my career as a state prosecutor yes. in DPP's office, and then I got married, and then I, mm -hmm. I left. Um, and for ten years, I was, you know, I was um, starting a family. Yes. I uh, raised children, right. and then I came back into uh, work. Uh, in 2008 right. and uh, you know started teaching at the University of the South Pacific as okay. a lecturer right. and then came into politics right after yes. but you know I I feel passionate about women who yes. uh, choose family and yes. who are full-time moms that look after their children I think it's the most important work you could do right. and so for me coming into the ministry and and being in this ministry looking after children and women um, is something very close to my heart and something I've lived yes. and so I I would say to any woman that has chosen to be a full-time mom you are doing the most important work you know and, and keep going because we need strong women to have a strong nation. Mm -hmm. And so being in the ministry for the last six months, coming into the ministry, yes. uh, of course it was baptism by fire, you know, <laughs> it was Christmas Eve and we were to form government. So having chosen this ministry, I, I felt that I needed to relook at what was happening in the ministry. Yes. Um, I want to thank my predecessors, uh, both uh, Marisaini Rakwita and Rosie Akbar, for the great work they've done mm. in the ministry. I think mm. they had their own challenges as women in politics, yes. as women ministers, mm. but despite that, they they came up with good programs, and I'll share that a bit later in right. the program. Yes. But I, I, I want to honor them and thank them for what they've done. Mm -hmm. um, however, there were quite a number of challenges that I faced coming yes. into the ministry. Um, firstly, we had our, you know, our welfare recipients that right. uh, were um, limited in terms of their choices. Okay. Um, there was also a, um, a shortfall in budget. Right. So we had to make do with the last six months of someone else's budget, the previous government. Yes. That was very challenging. Um, but you know, we, we got through and uh, we managed to you know, cut down on some expenses so that we could make it happen. Right. Um, we also had a, you know, um, low utilization budget areas yes. where we could pull from in order to support the programs okay. that were really there for our people, like looking after our children at risk, looking mm. after our p poor people. So right. that became the focus for the last six months. 
but I want to thank our team at the ministry. They yes. are they are such good workers, and they right. know their work. They just need a bit of a, uh, you know, um, enabling. Right. And I think that's what I also bring to um, the table. Is um, I like to trust um, yes. people I work with. Um, of course, there are times when, uh, you know, uh, as a leader, you need to have that conversation. Right. But generally, you know, we, are, we have such good uh, people in our ministry, and I want to thank them for holding on and yeah. just really bearing with us as a new government right. and with a new vision and a new policy for a new Fiji. Right. And they've just come on board and adjusted. And right. I, I want to thank them and, uh, you know, for, for working so hard in the last six months. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go back to your, you know, your beginnings. I think a lot of people would uh, not be aware that you can, uh, you have a, a uh, very humble beginnings. You came from, you know, so you understand the challenges that uh, people in poverty and uh, disenfranchised face. Can you just share a little bit about that? Does that help you do your work better as a minister? I've been asked many times why I'm in politics. And I remember my, my earliest memory, I was, you know, six or seven years old. And yes, growing up in poverty in an informal settlement outside of Suva, yes. I remember looking around and just saying to myself, I do not want anyone else to grow up like I did. Right. And so I want to be somewhere where I could make a difference, where I could make decisions that would affect the entire country. Right. So that I think was my earliest memory of why I wanted to be in um, politics and be national leadership. Right. And so my, my whole life after that um, was defined by this, this dream yes. that, I, that I wanted to take our people out of poverty. Right. And so I studied law, yes. uh, you know, to that, for that purpose, to come into politics. Yes. Um, you know, I um, attended Andida Kumbau School. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, better myself in terms yes. of my own culture and language. Uh, and I'm so thankful to my late great grandfather, you know, Chosevata Tambuya, who was an education officer. Right. And he placed me, you know, and, and I believe God placed me yes. in, the, in two very extreme um, ends, um, two schools that were quite extreme in right. their ends. I went to Yetsen Primary School, right. very multicultural, you know, in the okay. 80s. I was one of only six Itao K students in class one. Yes. The rest were all multicultural, but, you know, uh, then I went to Andida Kumbau School and right. it was just predominantly Ito okay. So I learned, but I think in all of that, um, I never lost my focus right. in terms of wanting to um, make a difference for our people and to bring our people out of poverty. And yeah. that's why I also chose this ministry. You know, oh, it, right. it is where it's all happening. Yes. So, and, and it's very exciting for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move into something a bit uh, of a, a, not a, well, a sensitive issue, kind of. Uh, you know, there's been criticism on social media about the decision to give direct cash instead of food vouchers as the previous administration did. Uh, just because of uh, past experience where when direct cash was given, it wasn't necessarily spent on the, the purpose that it was given for, you know, spent on alcohol, uh, grog and other things. So, you know, people have on social media have been very, um, how they have their very opinionated about this issue. So why did we, are we giving direct cash instead of the food vouchers? Uh, I am very well aware of the, the comments and the feedback that has come from our people. Uh, you know, the World Food, um, sorry. World Food Program uh, organization conducted a study worldwide and uh, they found that um, uh, giving cash to people right. um, showed that they actually the majority of people spend it on what they need to spend it on. Right. So there is there are studies to prove that and so yeah. cash transfers um, for us and for me, it was um, not a hard decision mm -hmm. because um, I feel we need to give p our people the choice. They need okay. to have the freedom. And with freedom, that freedom comes empowerment and a sense of dignity. Yes. Um, also, what happened uh, is that the, the $50 
food voucher was only limited to max value. Right. So it was in other participants, you know, other okay. supermarkets. And so people in the maritime and rural areas um, had to access a max value right. and they struggled with that. So they had to travel long distances to be able Just to do so. Right. So like people in Vatulele, for example, they have to come in the boat and come to come to Navua mm -hmm. to go to max value and do their shopping. Yes. By giving them cash and they have the ability to buy at their canteen, right. you know, uh, to buy at the post shop, to buy at the supermarket close to them. Right. You know, 50% of Fiji still lives in rural and maritime and we've yes. got to be very mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Um, the other issue is that our people now have the opportunity to buy fresh produce right. with that money. They can actually go out to the market mm -hmm. and buy fresh produce. And of course, with the increase um, you know, in prices, um, it gives our people the opportunity to, to be able to shop for healthier options as okay. well as um, shop outside of supermarket uh, you know, goods. Right. So I think uh, you know, I, I ask our people to you know, bear with us. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there will always be people that will abuse the system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but they are very few, you know, and the majority of our recipients are spending it on what they need, and so we will go by that. Okay, uh, you know, some might argue that uh, to access the cash, they'll have to still look for an ATM and or go somewhere where an ATM is, uh, is available. So they still have to travel. You know, that's just an argument on social media. So, uh, you know, just your thoughts on that. Thank you. We are actually working towards um, moving our recipients to receiving MPISA right. and MyCash. So we are encouraging our people more and more to um, have that um, app. Right. So we are working very closely with Vodafone, but you know we have a, an increasing number of recipients that are receiving their, their, um, their cash um, and their payout yeah. um, through MPISA and MyCash. Right. So we hope that our people will do that because it is available everywhere now you know even yes. in your corner store in in um, your island or your village they take and by sign my cash now so we yeah. hope that our people will move towards that so again yes. um, it's a challenge for us but it is what we're working on now to move our people towards a digital platform thank you minister um, we'll be right back after a short break We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to the Lens at 177. Uh, we're having a discussion about uh, social welfare programs and poverty with uh, the Minister for Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation, uh, Linda Tamboya. Um, Minister, there's been a marked increase in homeless people um, on the streets. We don't have the numbers. Uh, we're hoping you can shed some light on that. Uh, you know, and uh, we, quite a number of them are children. Um, as well. So, you know, my question is, uh, has, have you done any profiling on, on these homeless people? What were the findings and uh, why are people on the streets? I think people are asking that question too. The uh, earliest profiling that I experienced uh, since being in government was in January. Right. So we had a, a profiling in January and it was a continuation of the, the profiling of our, our street dwellers. Right. Um, we have conducted um, a few more since, yes. Um, but yes, uh, you know the findings from our our profiling is that first of all, we do not have homeless people. Okay. You know our it's okay majority are on the street come from a Yabusa, you know, come yes. from a Tokatoka, come from a Matangali, who will always have a home with family. Yeah. What we find is that our people who are choosing to live on the streets is because they're having issues at home. Right. They are dealing with issues at home that are unresolved. You know, it includes yes. violence, it includes abuse. Um, it, it also includes um, when our children um, or adults 
adults are, um, who are the majority, uh, that the issues they face is um, addiction to drugs. Right. So we have our children who are addicted to glue sniffing, you know, yes. to glue, industrial glue, as well as our adults who have come across uh, the marijuana or ice. Yes. And so the families don't know how to deal with them at home. Yes. And they themselves, the adults, the children, don't know how to deal with that addiction. So there is a disconnect in terms of services to be provided to help our people on the street. So they come out to the street because they're not wanted at home or they don't know how to deal with the issues at home. Right. So, um, and that's the majority of our people. They need psychosocial services. They need yes. mental health services. And so the latest drive of profiling that we've done, and this was in the news in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. was to deal with our, um, our street children uh, in terms of a pathway right. out to, to come out from the street. And yes. so we are talking to our um, um, possible service providers to come on board, mm -hmm. like the Salvation Army and St. Vincent de Paul, um, to look at them creating a space where our children can be housed and then they will be provided drug rehabilitation right. as well as um, mental health and counseling services. Mm -hmm. and, and not only that, we are now partnering with the Ministry for Youth uh, to provide a pathway in terms of education. Right and then employment. And so, as you know, we're opening up our TVET colleges again. Yes. We have our youth centers that can um, train our children yes. at any age. You know, even yes. if they're 10 or 12, they can be brought in to be trained. Mm -hmm. And so from there, we can then place them in jobs when they're over 15. Yes. Now, of course, the younger ones, 10 to 12 year olds, once we rehab them, uh, we're exploring the option of putting them in boarding schools yes. um, so that they can be, you know, they can be feel part of a community again, okay. or feel part of, um, you know, their own peer groups again, mm -hmm. as well as placing them um, in our homes like St. Christopher's Home has opened up the Moana Home yeah. for boys from yeah. 13 years old. And so there are, there are gaps in our services. Mm -hmm. You know, f like for our state homes, right. our 18 year old girls, once they turn 18 from Dokusha or the homes, they have to leave. And there's no pathway provided yeah. for them. And for boys, when they're 13, they have to leave. So where do they go? Like, they, do they, they, go? They're just, they go back out into the to their families or they're placed with families. And so this is a repeat pattern of our children who've been in state care. Right. So it is upon us as the government, upon us as a ministry to provide these pathways. Right. And so thankfully now our 13 year olds can go to St. Christopher's home right. or we're looking at boarding school options, right. you know, where we partner with the Ministry for Education to provide this pathway. Mm -hmm. And of course, for our girls, I'm very thankful to APTC and the government of Australia Yes. that has come through to pilot the first program for our girls coming out of the homes okay. where they will be put into um, an engineering level certificate level okay. two which is an entry level yes. so it's starting in October so we're piloting it with ten girls right. um, the other girls um, who were not doing so well at the state homes, we've actually um, sent them to uh, boarding school. So I want to thank Jasper Williams High School right. for taking in a couple of our girls who were not thriving in the homes, right. and they are in the boarding schools now, and they are doing so well. Okay. So you know, these okay. are little changes, but yes. they are so significant for a child. Yeah. And you know, those are kind of, because otherwise, if we don't look after them, they'll end up on the street, yes. Yes. and they have nowhere to go. Yes. So these are some of the things that we are working working very hard and I thank my assistant minister, Honorable Sashi Kiran, who is right out there mm. championing with the Minister for Youth, uh, Chesi Sokuru, yes. and of course our Minister for Education who's also come on board. All right. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, these programs and um, you, now you've got a timeline, you've got October and, and all that. Um, how important is it for other actors, you know, apart from government, uh, non-government organizations, churches, faith-based organizations, the Hindu religious community, you know, all, all those communities, um, what role can they play yes. you know, in, in, in helping out? Government all. cannot do it alone. Right. We have the means, we can provide the resources in terms of funding, but we need our service to provide us to come on board and, yeah. and especially, especially my challenges to the churches. Yes. And I want to thank the, uh, you know, the, um, 
the uh, Fiji Council of Churches uh, who have come on board. I actually had a meeting with 20 pastors um, last week right. and you know it, we were all on the same page about what to do. I think they just needed um, a government to come to yes. the table and say let's work together. Right. You know something that has not been nurtured um, in the past or taken advantage of and I believe there's huge potential there to partner with our churches right. um, especially yeah. to bring um, a program together so that we can lift our people out of poverty. We can take care of our children on the streets. We can take care of our adults on the streets. Right. And so it is a reflection of our society yes. and how society has been. And mm -hmm. we need to heal our relationships with non-governmental organizations. Yeah. That's a big challenge for government at the moment. Right. But you know, I'm so thankful that they've come to the table when we've made the call or they've invited me yes. and Honorable Karen to go into their spaces to say, let's talk, right. you know, let's talk. And so that mm -hmm. to me is the real change that's happening in our country. You okay. know, we have to partner together, Felix, yes. you know, and I'm, I'm thankful to some champions who've come forward to say, let's do this together. And, mm -hmm. you know, like Salvation Army said, we've got a space in Samambola that you can use. Right. The churches in the West have said, you know, we're going to open up our halls, you can bring them. Uh, and even Fiji Women's Crisis Center said, you can use our space in Bar. So they're coming forward. Right. It's there. It's there. We just yes. need to come together and mm -hmm. collaborate more. And I'm really, really encouraged yes. by the change that's happening there. Right. Thank you. Um, you know, linked to that, uh, I understand the ministry is trying to reunite some of the children and homeless. Well, they're not homeless people, like <laughs> you said, uh, back with their families. Yes. So how successful has that been? I uh, believe that uh, this process we are putting in place needs to happen right. and uh, it will happen at the pace of um, the professionals that we engage in terms of our children who are addicted to drugs, who right. are addicted to glue. And so that process needs to take place. So however long we need to keep these children in state care right. because they become you know, wards of the state and okay. so they come directly legally under the ministry. Right. And so we are um, looking at that process how fast can we reunite them with their family we yeah. would like to keep the option open of families being able to visit them right. when they wherever they are placed in yes. terms of the care that the state will provide but yes as soon as possible we want to reunite families but we want our children to be healthier children right. we want them to get the, the, the professional help they need right. and the education they need right. and the pathways to employment they need when they're over 15 right. um, and so that is a challenge for yeah. you know for our ministry yeah. but uh, again you know i'm just i'm just very thankful for committed individuals and committed organizations who've come on board to say let's work together to do this right you you keep mentioning um, drug addiction and glue um, you know the glue issue has been an issue for years you know and we still haven't seen any changes to the laws uh, surrounding making glue um, uh, you know, to ensure that glue is just not sold willy-nilly to children. Yes. Um, you know, just your thoughts on maybe the slow process to get that happening when children can now go to any canteen shop and just purchase a can of glue. You know, Felix, uh, it's very unfortunate, but mm. you know, we are, as adults are taking advantage of our children. Mm. You know, the, the shopkeepers and shop owners, they boast Right. that their number one seller yes. is the glue. Right. And so even more than bread, even more than any other goods they sell. Yes. And to me, that's, a re that's really unfortunate. Right. And to me, it's exploitation of children yes. because it is our children that, is bu that are buying. In terms of the law, I'm very happy to, you know, to announce that we are, we are now progressing on the um, volatile substance bill, right. which has been in the Attorney General's office for quite some time. Yes. And we've been following up from 2021 in terms of uh, passing the bill. But in that bill, um, which is currently going through consultation now with the right. attorney, the Solicitor General's office, so I thank the Honorable Attorney General for moving fast on this. Right. Um, it is being the consultation is being done by the Ministry of Education because it comes under their okay. um, right. their ministry. The the Substance Abuse Advisory Council is right. now doing the consultation. We are very involved as a ministry, mm -hmm. and so we hope to um, to bring it to Parliament in September. Okay. But in that bill. 
we are looking at regulating yes. the sale of industrial glue right. to licensed users only. Yes. So it will be illegal. Right. It will be illegal to right. sell glue to children. Okay. or to anyone that is not licensed. Right. So, because they are, it's hardware, yes. glue. And so it needs to be limited to hardware stores and anyone right. that's licensed or a builder or construction company. Right. Um, that needs to be the limitation on it, but they yeah. need to get a license for it. Right. So it's coming, you know, we're moving fast on it. And, you right. know, thankfully, we're all on the same page in terms of needing to protect our children yes. from these very, very, um, you know, very, um, destructive yes. uh, drug that yes. is so easily available on the street for us. Thank you, Minister. We'll be right back after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to The Lens at 177. I'm having a discussion with uh, one of our more colorful characters in Parliament. <laughs> Uh, colorful ministers, I should say, uh, Minister for Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation, Linda Tambuya. Uh, Minister, the National Action Plan to prevent violence against all women and girls has been launched, but where are we in terms of the rollout? Firstly, I want to just confirm to our people that um, our ministry has changed its name. Right. So we are the Ministry for Women, Children and Social Protection. And social, protection. social Protection is more encompassing and poverty alleviation comes under it. And right. it's a more positive, you know, okay. um, message. But uh, look, the National Action Plan on uh, to prevent gender-based violence before it starts, we launched it in June. Yes. So currently now we are in the process, uh, as we work with UN Women, we're in the process of um, putting together the implementation unit. Right. So there is a budget for the next four years and mm -hmm. we thank the government of Australia as well as the um, other donors who've come on board to support us on this. Yes. So we have a four-year time plan. We're hoping that by September mm -hmm. we, have, um, we are going to um, hire a um, NAP GBV coordinator. Right. So that person is then going to be placed in UN Women to then roll out this um, this particular plan. Okay. And part of that plan, which I'm excited about, is a, mm. an, a, a massive communications campaign, which I look forward to partnering with Fiji Times. Thank you very you know, much. To do so, because we need messaging. We need yes. to raise the awareness as well as taking it out to all our people you know social media has become the the place now to yes. get news but i believe we can use it for good yes. and so we are going to roll out a massive communications campaign in the first four months right. and this will be done by the coordinator um, and this will include, you know, physical visits as well as media, um, you know, presence right. about the messaging that is in, in this NAP. And, and really, it, it goes back to what our women and our children have come forward to tell us in this NAP because it was a, a whole of society and a whole of government approach. Yes. And I think the most powerful thing about this document is that it is based on actual statistics. Right. So it's not on any modeling data, it's actually based on actual statistics that was provided by the Bureau of Statistics as well as other organizations that work together. So right. we're working on actual evidence, evidence and data, yes. right. and then we're looking forward to rolling out this plan. Thank you. Um, some would say, you know, maybe there should be programs in schools where young men are taught to be young men and uh, you know women young girls should be taught to be how to uh, be a, a good uh, citizen woman that's an that's a discussion that's uh, going on should should there be something like that in the school curriculum before they even come in, uh, come out of school and go into university and the work, workforce and before they become parents Yes. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Uh, the 
for the very first time um, in our budget this year, we have been able to achieve gender responsive budgeting, which means uh, the Ministry for Youth and the Ministry for Education and the Ministry for Ital Care Affairs now have a budget line yes. that says NAP GBV. So they as ministries are committed right. to uh, supporting uh, the rollout of this national action plan. And so that means that the Ministry for Education now has the budget to commit to doing exactly that. Okay. That we look at the curriculum right. Right. and we uh, put in the curriculum mm -hmm. values-based education, right. which uh, will promote respect between girls and boys. That you know what, it's okay to have a male friend. Yes. It's okay to have a female friend mm -hmm. and to have a healthy relationship between yes. girls and boys or a healthy relationship between older children and younger children um, and, and also a healthy relationship between adults and children. And so um, this is something we are working with with the Ministry for Education mm -hmm. as well as the Ministry for Ital Care Affairs in terms mm -hmm. of taking our messaging out to our our, you know, rural Fiji right. and to our villages, uh, you know, so we are very excited about partnering with these ministries right. and I think more will, come, will happen as we roll this NAP out to see that other ministries can come on board to, to support it as well. Okay, um, you mentioning the Ministry of Itoke Affairs, but you know, what about our um, Indo-Fijian community, we have the Rotuman community and other communities as well? How will you roll it out and get the programs out to them? So in the Ministry for Ital Care Affairs is also the culture and heritage. Right. And so under that, it, it captures our, um, our non Ital Care okay. communities. So right. that budget will also be, you know, will be, be, um, be dedicated to them. Right. Um, you know, we, we hope that, um, that uh, you know, the, the NAP itself will be, will be informed to the entire you know population in the first four months in this you know this huge communications campaign that we, we will roll out okay thank you um, organizations like the Fiji Women's Crisis Center uh, and uh, uh, you know and other organizations like that who do a lot of work in domestic violence and child abuse say patriarchy is the primary reason for violence, abuse of women and girls, and also for women and girls not being given the same opportunities as men. Um, in your view, is patriarchy the only reason? Patriarchy is what has, uh, is a term that has encapsulated all of the issues to deal with that, that causes um, the discrimination and causes right. the, the, the abuse. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's about a sense of entitlement. You know, right. when you when you have the sense of entitlement, that is misplaced, yes. that is um, wrongly, um, uh, you know, projected. Right. You know, whether it's men, whether it's women, whether it's you know uh, an employer or someone in a position of authority right. that asserts that authority mm -hmm. unrighteously. Yes. You know, unrighteously yeah. becomes, you know, that term you know, patriarchy, and I think patriarchy has been used because these statistics yes. alone show that it's majority of perpetrators are men, right. and majority of, um, you know, of uh, the power imbalances are caused by men. Yes. yes, there are women that, you know, that do, um, you know, that do also abuse positions of power, mm -hmm. but very minute, you know, the, yes. the majority, the overwhelming majority of statistics around the world mm -hmm. and in Fiji um, is by men. So that's the use of the word patriarchy. Right. But having said that, you know, I, I, I feel that um, we as a community, as a society and all the players, we have to work together to right. tackle this issue. Yes. It cannot be done by government alone. It cannot be done by Fiji Women's Crisis Center alone. It cannot be done by just the women's movement. Right. We need the churches. Right. Where are the churches yes. in this? You know, you are custodians and you look after the temporal needs too of your flock. Right. Where are the religious organizations uh, who can preach this from the pulpit right. and say, you know, it is not right for a man to hurt a woman right. or to hurt a child. You know, it is not right to abuse someone, you know, so, or to cause violence. So this needs to be 
done you know in a, in a stronger way mm -hmm. because we are we are a god-fearing nation right. you know we are have very strong religious organizations in fiji and our faith guides us a lot in yes. what we do mm -hmm. so why couldn't we use that um to put out a message for good to say just you know just don't hurt another person right. you know it comes down to the end of the day just don't hurt another person yes. you know um, kindness and love and respect and uh, you know dignity of our people right. um, these values need to be brought back yes. into our, our society and so that's a, that's something we, we should work towards thank you um, last week you know, we read in the media, in our media organization also reported it, something that uh, I thought we'd never uh, see and read about in, in, uh, in our news. Children left in cars while their parents go clubbing. And the police came out very strongly and said that they, you know, they're going to uh, actually deal with uh, any uh, guardian or parent that does that. You know, what, what what kind of people do we have in society if that's what they're doing? They're putting their kids in the car while they go out to the club. You know, what, 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 what's wrong? Is there, what, what's your message to parents and guardians, you know, and, uh, about this issue? As the Minister for Children, I mean, this is shocking. Yes. This is shocking for us to see this. You know, that the, the level that we can get to because um, of the desperation of the need to, for parents to have a break. Yes. You know, I, I, I um, do not condone it. You know, I believe our children need to be safe at all times. Yes. You know, and so, but, you know, having said that, you know, Felix, this is not something new. Right. You know, um, what has happened in the past is that children have been left in internet cafes while parents right. have gone out so you know uh, they buy they buy data bundles yes. for their teenage children and they sit at the internet cafe and play games all night you know the police are aware of this they've raided internet cafes where children were even exposed to pornography right. so they are having unlimited access to the internet yes. um, now that some you know internet cafes have been shut down uh, you know the this has now happened where you know parents are now leaving children in cars it is absolutely not acceptable mm -hmm. for a child for a parent to neglect a child yes. and so we as a ministry need to come down harder yes. we will push for harsher pun punishments for parents who neglect their children right. you know and this is uh, something that uh, we as a government are taking very seriously working with the fiji police force i uh, i just please caution parents you know get help if you need uh, for someone to look after your children mm -hmm. uh, you know there's no perfect parent but you know do your best and doing your best means taking care of our most vulnerable who are our children yes thank you we'll be right back uh, with the last segment uh, just after this short break We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to The Lens at 177. I'm here with the Minister for Women, Children and Social Protection. Social Protection. <laughs> uh, Linda Tamboya. Um, Minister, you know, with about 29% of our population living in poverty, uh, and the obvious uh, socio-economic implications of that, increased crime, domestic violence, child abuse, what can we do to make Fiji a better country? I believe, uh, in my opinion, is the need to empower our people economically. Yes. You know, um, poverty is a very multi-dimensional issue. Um, there's always reasons why people are in poverty. But what we are doing currently, because we are working with our, our database of our social welfare recipients, yeah. uh, you know, we are at about 15,000 now of our people that yeah. are uh, on our social welfare family assistance scheme. Right. 
um, and they are the ones that we are creating our database now because it's been manual all this time. Yes. We're now digitizing this database so that we can ascertain right. the people that are on the poverty program, whether or not they should be on it. You know, okay. So um, we are looking at cleaning up our system so that we can see who we need to graduate out of the program. Right. But we don't just kick them off a system. Right. Um, we're taking it upon ourselves as the ministry to, to provide pathways for our people. So, okay. you know, with this whole labor mobility scheme and people yes. leaving, we have a huge opportunity here to employ our people that are on the social welfare scheme, right. to educate them so we can put them through our colleges, mm -hmm. put them through APTC, right. uh, our youth center and other means, because, you know, we're bringing them back and mm -hmm. um, I'm pushing for and negotiating with Ministry for Education to provide scholarships yes. for our recipients, okay. you know, of right. the program, yes. so that they don't have to um, pay for the schooling, yes. but they can be bonded, which means they will stay after the program and they will give back right. to Fiji. But if they choose to leave after that, you know, we, we can't stop them. Right. Um, as long as a person moves from poverty to productivity, we're happy for them, you know? So um, that's that. And then of course, as we are profiling our street children and our, our, um, our adults who are on the street, um, we are looking at, as a ministry, to appeal to other government agencies mm -hmm. to come on board to, um, you know, to make it easier for our, you know, our people who want to help themselves, that they can, um, you know, they can go through the system and be enabled. For example, if they want to register a business, you know, right. and get a business license, mm -hmm. uh, we want to look at providing it, you know, free of charge with no okay. fees. Right. If they need a birth certificate, mm -hmm. you know, and if they show their social welfare card, then they get um, a birth certificate for free. Okay. You know, and those things, a police clearance, I mean, these things cost a lot of money. Yes. And and if we don't provide these pathways for our, our people who really need it, then they will just give up. Yes. And then they will just go home and then they will not make themselves productive. So we as a government, it is upon us yes. to enable and to, you know, to create pathways to remove obstacles for our people who are really in need. And this is what we are committed to doing. And so. Uh, when you raise a person out of poverty, there are five or six people around that person right. that is yes. dependent on them. So you are lifting an entire family out of poverty. And, and that's what we're working on. Um, I want to thank the Marriott Hotel that has come on board. They, ha they have had 400 spaces right. and they've asked for us to provide about 300. We're not moving fast enough for our employers who need, who have vacancies. So, they went to so take, they, they, take, they're, uh, they've taken on some already. Right. We profiled um, right. some street dwellers in the West right. um, and some of our children who can go to work and they've taken um, a first lot, yeah. uh, okay. you know, th through their program because right. they, they're now doing training on the job. Like right. you come in entry level, right. no experience needed and they train you and you stay in the job. Yeah. So right. the tourism industry is suffering, right. the construction industry is suffering, Right. Um, out, you know, the, of course you've got the, the places that need skills like teachers and nurses mm. and, and, and the like. Mm. But these, but these entry level work like trades yes. and, and tourism work right. is where we're going to be majority of our people will go because it doesn't require previous experience. So right. we're working on that, Felix. And, yes. you know, I again thank the Ministry of Education as well as the Ministry for Youth to provide the pathways in terms of considering scholarships through TEL. Right. so that they don't have to pay anything, mm -hmm. um, as well as working with the Honorable Attorney General mm -hmm. uh, to look at those other services and agencies like birth certificates and also police clearance with the you know, Ministry for Home Affairs um, to, to come on board and to provide these pathways for our people, to lift our people out of poverty and into productivity. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end the show by asking you uh, maybe a bit of a light-hearted question. <laughs> Yesterday, we welcomed the Airbus A350. Yes. And uh, you had made a comment in Parliament uh, during COVID about eating aeroplanes. <laughs> and and know, the TikTok. And the TikTok. <laughs> and the TikTok as yes. well. So, you know, some people are uh, saying on social media again and on Twitter, uh, you know, that it's ironic that we need this aircraft to push our economic growth forward 
and uh, you have made those comments and the TikTok. <laughs> just, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, it was uh, made at a place and time, right. and it was only to be limited for that place and time. Right. But I, d I don't doubt that it will continue to haunt me. <laughs> um, but you know, but in any event, I think the you know the the significance of how the tourism industry is taken off in our country yes. and how we need to keep up is um, you know cannot be understated you know right. overstated sorry mm -hmm. so we as a government need to keep up you know mm -hmm. and that's our responsibility and I fully support what the you know the tourism industry is doing as well as Fiji Airways mm -hmm. um, you know you know the the irony and the you know the jokes and the humor aside yes. um, it is a time now for us as we go into recovery where COVID is now a thing of the past, right. that we do need to make these decisions now. And it is yes. the right decision now for this time, right. now that we've come out of COVID. Mm -hmm. I didn't agree with the decision back then right. yeah, yes. because we needed to look after our people and right. being at the forefront of supporting our people who were struggling. Yes. Um, I was right there in the forefront of it. And there were choices that the government made at the time that I felt was not right, that yes. we needed to focus on feeding our people. Mm -hmm. um, thus that, you know, at the time and place, right. but look, Bring it. <laughs> we'll keep going. <laughs> uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, on behalf of the Fiji Times, thank you very much for joining us on the show. And uh, we know we hope to have you back here. I would uh, be very happy to come yeah, back. At some point in the future. Natcha, thank you, Felix. Thank you. Thank you, Fiji Times. And uh, that's all from us at uh, Lens at 177. Uh, vis please visit our website, www.fijitimes.com, and our social media platforms to watch this show and um, to see our beautiful uh, guest <laughs> as she uh, sp uh, spoke uh, s at length and clarified a lot of issues that, uh, and questions that people were asking. Thank you, and we hope to see you again. Nakovakalevu and happy India Independence Day.